Hello, this is um, another lecture video of the Deroga series. Today we present Pregnancy Induction of Labour, part 1, where we focus on the indication and the why of the induction of labour. Um, part 1 will discuss the inductions and the why, and part 2, a separate video, will focus on the various methods and more on the how, on the practicalities. This, uh, these two videos are um, it's very good news. There's a lot of very good recent randomized clinical trials, and I will include them um, in order to help us to uh, make the most informed uh, decisions when we manage patients. When I would ask students the question, would you mind listing for me the indications for induction of labor? Quite often, the answer is that the students try to express me by spitting out in random order whatever option the student can think of. Well, that's one way to approach the question. Another way, and that of course is uh, it, it's somewhat chaotic and uh, it's probably not the best way to do it. That's why in the overview of the induction of labor, I will focus first on the main question is inducing labor in principle should be done when continuation of the pregnancy outweighs the risk associated with delivery, sometimes even preterm delivery, for the mother and or her unborn child. So that's the, the most important sentence to consider when we are uh, talking about indications. For now, let's do it Systematic, systematically, maternal, we have a couple of maternal indications, fetal indications, and sometimes combined. Maternal, there are a number of clinical considerations, medical considerations, where it's better for the mother to induce labor. Psychosocial, geographical, particularly for a big country like Australia. And fetal, yeah, usually it's only clinical because the fetal has not yet a voice to indicate, to speak to us. And of course, important that we, that we are aware of absolute and relative contraindications to consider an induction of labor. Let's focus now on the maternal indication. So now, continuation of the pregnancy outweighs the risk associated with delivery for the mother. A topic is hypertension in pregnancy or preeclampsia after 37 weeks plus. The big randomized clinical trials from the Netherlands, the Hepatite 1 study, will be discussed to answer this question. A study by Koopmans and et al. Psychosocial, quite common, mothers, mother-to-be, after 36, 37 weeks, they have more symptoms of pressure, uh, shortness of breath, discomfort, and they voice at us as um, I'm fed up with the pregnancy. Sometimes for practical reasons, the husband works, for instance, in the mines and needs to be back at work at a certain date. Um, and convenience plays sometimes a role in the what we call the psychosocial reasons. Geographical or logistic factors are particularly important in, um, in, uh, uh, in Australia. We will discuss them, especially for women who live in rural, remote Australia. Rapid labor is an indication if a lady had a very quick delivery previously Previously, you probably want to avoid that the baby is born before arrival, in the car or at home. Let's look now at the HIPPITAT study. We see that was a randomized clinical trial um, where women with mild hypertension or preeclampsia after 36 weeks were randomized to either an induction of labor group or an expectant monitoring group. The induction of labor group was 377 women and uh, 379 in the expectant monitoring group. The results are shown here in this table. Severe hypertension was obviously uh, statistically uh, more often the case, uh, both looking at the ones off or the repetitive measurement of the systolic and diastolic blood pressure in the expectant management group. We see that here in the first and the second arrow. And also, the group, expectant management group, had significantly more often needed antihypertensives. 
So, in conclusion, the induction of labor group mothers had significantly less hypertension and hence less use of antihypertensive drugs. That was the main difference found in this study. By the way, the mothers had no increased risk for instrumental vaginal delivery or a lower segment cesarean section when they were induced. When they were induced. And in neither of the both groups eclampsia took place. That's because proper prudent management and using of use of anticonvulsive management, such as magnesium sulfate IV. There were no differences in both groups in adverse neonatal outcomes. Conclusion: If there is mild hypertension, when you read the study very carefully, induction of labor after 39 weeks is recommended. And in case of preeclampsia, so uh, signs of organ dysfunction, uh, the recommendation would be after 37 weeks of uh, pregnancy. That is apparently the safest option. Of course, we have to always consider the individual circumstances from the woman in front of us, whether we should induce or wait a bit longer. But this is a very good study, very well executed and with clear-cut results. Let me focus now on another indication, the geographical indication. And for people not living in Australia or South Australia, here is the distance between Sejuna, the little blue spot over here, and Adelaide over here. If you follow the road, it takes you 786 kilometers to travel. For high-risk women, do you realize there is no major hospital in between Sejuna and um, Adelaide? Some regional hospitals, but high-risk women could not deliver there. So, a little picture of the beach in Sejuna here. Nice spot there, great to watch whales um, at the season is right. Imagine, this is the distance, the same distance between Melbourne and Victoria and Adelaide. Or, if you go to Europe, from London to Coburg in Bavaria, Germany. That's the same distance, it's about 489 miles. If you live in uh, the east coast of the United States, that's the distance between New York and Raleigh in North Carolina, as you can see here. So imagine, this is the tyranny of distance in Australia. And sometimes women come to my hospital just to deliver and be induced because of what we can call geographical reasons. Let's now move on to fetal indications. So the continuation of the pregnancy outweighs the risk associated with delivery and postnatal life for the fetus, even if that's preterm. I will use, there is an increased fetal risk compromise for post-term pregnancy. And I will refer to a great study from Norway to explain it a bit further. Secondly, if the membranes rupture um, before term, we refer that as pre-labor, pre-term rupture of membranes. P-PROM is the acronym, the mnemonic. A great study done and recently published from um, uh, Sydney and other centers, Adelaide and also New Zealand, published in um, The Lancet just a few weeks ago. Um, this study dealt with women who had P-PROM between 34 and 37 weeks, so late preterm. Let me now move to the study in Norway. Very big population cohort study, including all uh, women who delivered in Norway. Um, it's altogether 234,000 women. And we see here the gestational age in weeks, 37, climbing up to more than 42 weeks. And they split the whole group in two. On the left-hand side, we see the non-small gestational age newborn babies. And on the right-hand side, we see the SGA babies. So, per definition, less than the 10th percentile customized. And what um, is remarkable, that in the... Uh, in, as the gestational age increases between 37 and 42 weeks, we can see the number of stillbirths per thousand newborn babies um, gradually creeping up of 0 0.14 at 37 weeks to more than 1.17 per thousand in the non-SGA group. If we compare that with the small for gestational age group here, we see that the risk 
is increasing as well if, if uh, the duration of pregnancy increases, but more, more importantly, the risk is much higher um, after if you compare the SGA and the non-SGA. Let's say, for instance, at 42 weeks, the risk is roughly six times higher. So the stillbirth rate increased after 37 weeks already, but in particular in the small for gestational age baby group. So probably this is a solid indication to induce labor, unless we had a perfect method to detect SGA. I refer for this topic to the uh, four uh, videos about antenatal detection of SGA. By the way, what is the best time to induce labor? Post-term, the definition of post-dates or over tight in, in the Netherlands, most states and territories in Australia and countries around the world recommend induction of labor after 40 plus 10 or 42 plus weeks, but the so there are slightly different definitions. In that regard, it's fascinating and interesting that this moment as we speak, the ARRIVE study, the big randomized clinical trials being executed in the United States, where first time pregnant, uh, first women who have never delivered before will be induced routinely at 39 weeks or will be randomized to expected management. And the primary outcome of this study is the composite of serious neonatal morbidity and perinatal mortality. So you can imagine it needs quite a few thousand um, newborn babies to be in, uh, in each arm of the study in order to come to significant differences and to avoid that the study is underpowered. So watch this space. You can see the URL here below. Conclusion, induction of labor is supported for post term pregnancies, especially um, if the fetal is well grown, maybe a little bit later, but especially we're not completely sure when the cutoff should be. So we have to wait for the study in the United States. Um, keep an eye on the arrived results, I would say. And then induction of labor for SGA or suspicion of IGR, a fetus of more than 37 weeks is probably warranted if we look at the result of the a study in Norway and is confirmed in many other st studies. I just used a very good example to illustrate this. Let's now move to the second big randomized clinical trial, the P-PROMPT studies. So this was a study where uh, women with preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes between 34 and 37 weeks were randomized to either induction of labor or expected management, if at least at that stage at an entry there were no obvious sign of chorea and neonitis. But what were the results in this big study? By the way, it took about nine years to recruit a sufficient number of uh, uh, newborn babies. 923 in the immediate delivery group, so induction of labor group, and 912 in the expectant management group. And if you look at the results, the primary outcome was neonatal sepsis, no differences. If we look at some of the other outcomes, like, of course, if you induce labor quickly, early, there's more respiratory distress, there is more mechanical ventilation required, and you stay a bit longer in the hospital. So that's understandable. So, interesting as well, routine induction of labor, the cesarean section rate in the immediate delivery group was a bit higher, 26 versus 19%, which is significant. So, in conclusion, um, P prom between 34 and 37 weeks without signs of chorioamnionitis, expected management appears to be, in a, be beneficial for the fetus. The fetus has no increased risk for neonatal sepsis. And um, yeah, if you uh, wait or if you induce later, there is some more, more, more respiratory problems, but they can be managed quite safely. The mothers had a lower cesarean section rate in the expectant management group. Why these short-term effects are very convincing, we have to keep in mind what is the effect at the age of maybe two or three years. There are some indications that the group who was um, um, in the expected management group, that there are, there's a link with a slightly lower IQ, but that has to be carefully monitored, of course. Hence, based on the P-PROMT RCT, there is no convincing clinical reason to induce labor routinely 
if there's no signs of chorea and nymphnitis, but watchful waiting seems to be a, um, the best approach. If we continue with fetal indications, there are a few more, like rhesus aloe immunization, if there's signs of severe fetal anemia, um, closer to term, recurrent antepartum hemorrhage, which quite often is caused by um, small placental abruptions, chorioamnonitis, a clear-cut indication to deliver the baby because waiting could result in increased risk for sepsis of the baby but also increased risk for cerebral palsy. Fetal malformations incom incompatible with life, referred to my Daroga lecture about uh, the routine screening in pregnancy, the morphology scan, the anatomy scan and the anatomy scan. Fetal demise or intrauterine fetal death. Poorly controlled gestational diabetes because we know in that group in particular there's also, probably due to metabolic uh, reasons, um, uh, a higher risk for intrauterine fetal death. And interesting, suspected large for, large for gestational age fetus. The Imminence Grise, here a beautiful picture of the Cardinal Richelieu in, um, and the term uh, Imminence Grise is, um, comes from him. What we need to realize there is now to answer the question should we induce labor if we suspect a large for gestational age baby? In the past that decision was made on the most senior person in the room, quite often a person with grey hair, hence Imminence Grise, or the person who had the title of professor. He or she would state, in my experience it's better to induce, or in my experience, I remember a case where, and then you have a, a case report of an individual case where things went wrong. Nowadays, we moved on from eminence-based to evidence-based medicine, or evidence-informed medicine. A big randomized clinical trial done in Switzerland, France and Belgium, in French-speaking countries over there, they induced, they had a big randomized clinical trial where they said, let's randomize babies where we expect they are uh, large, so more than the 90th percentile, either to induce labor or to wait. And here we see the result of this study. Roughly, let's say 407 women were in the induction of labor group, 411 in the expectant management group. And the composite primary outcome was um, there was a, a reduced risk and that was particularly due to a significant lower chance for severe shoulder dystocia or the delivery of the head would, would take more than 60 seconds, which is a marker of severity of the shoulder dystocia. And, all, and there were no significant differences, by the way, in the fracture rate, as you can see, no brachial plexus les, uh, lesion or no intracranial, intracranial hemorrhage or no death. Probably this study was slightly underpowered. The study was finished a bit earlier. That had to do with um, uh, finance. So in conclusion, when the baby is suspected to be LGA, as based on an ultrasound scan estimated fetal weight, it's probably beneficial to induce labor rather than to wait until Mother Nature makes a decision. As mentioned, the study was slightly underpowered to find any differences in the severe and the serious complications. Secondary outcomes, um, spontaneous vaginal delivery, no differences. Um, and here we see the secondary outcomes for the neonate, basically the whole list apart from a slightly higher bilirubin uh, and slightly higher risk for phototherapy, there were no significant differences for the fetus. So, in conclusion, this um, European RCT supports induction of labor in case of the baby is suspected LGA. And here you see an exa example of an LGA baby. Anybody will, in a split second, agree that this, is, this looks very much like a sugar baby. Good, let's go back. Um, there are a few big randomized clinical trials. I mentioned already before the indications to induce labor. What did we find in the probate study in 
2011. Uh, we will discuss that study later in part two. Um, you can see here almost one third of the population was induced because of hypertensive disorders, so hypertension in pregnancy and or preeclampsia. Post-term, here in the Netherlands def defined more than or equal to 41 weeks. Intrauterine growth restriction, a small part. Elective reasons, psychosocial. Insulin-dependent diabetes, small group. Oligohydramnion, interesting that that was an indication. That's not supported by solid research, by the way. And in the PROBAT2 study, uh, uh, published in 2016, um, we can see the same pattern. Hypertensive disorder, one third roughly, post-storm deliveries also, and then the other groups, they are self-explanatory. Contraindications to induce labor. There are a few, and of course, that needs to be taken into consideration as well. Transverse or oblique lie is an absolute contraindication because induction of labor could result in uterine rupture because this fetal lie is non-compatible with a normal vaginal delivery or even instrumental vaginal delivery. We have to bail out and if we are unable to do an external cephalic version, that means a cesarean section. Vesa previa or placenta previa covering the internal os a presenting umbilical cord. So when we start doing induction of labor, it's important that we're sure that the presenting part is cephalic and there's no umbilical cord dangling there. A previous transfundal uterine surgery. One example is a classical caesarean section where the myometrium is, has been incised or a myomectomy where the uterine cavity was breached. This is uh, where everybody agrees, based on observational studies, an insignificant uh, uh, increased risk for uterine rupture. Hence, most of us would not in dare to do an induction of labor in these instances. Active genital herpes, because if the baby would be born vaginally, that would result in increased risk for the fatal neonatal sepsis. So, contraindication, yes. Cervical cancer. Very uncommon in Australia or in the high income countries, but for instance in Africa or India, that's an absolute contraindication for a vaginal delivery or an induction of labor. Another indication, a relative contraindication, is a relative one, is one or two previous cesarean sections. In Australia at the moment, we, uh, there, we know there is an increased risk for uterine rupture which is not much more when you compare one previous or two previous cesarean sections, but this is outside the scope of this lecture. Um, in principle, we know that after one cesarean section, that an elective cesarean section is associated with the lowest risk for uterine dehiscence and rupture. The risk goes up when we administer either prostaglandins or oxytocin, and even it goes higher if we combine the two. So, induction of labor only um, in specific circumstances. About the induction of labor using a balloon, there is no hard and fast data, but we will discuss that later, the methods of induction later on. So balloon induction of labor is maybe an area where you could, which could be considered. Um, what we have to realize, the relative risk for uterine rupture and um, a, a, a fatal outcome, fetal demise, the relative risk is increased, but the absolute risk is still low, and it depends very much where you work. We never ever, wherever you are, can guarantee a perfect outcome. That is incompatible with anything we do in life, but still, this area is still being debated quite considerably. And of course, as always, this decision has to be made by a woman who is well informed. And she is eventually the one who makes the decision. Okay, as you all know, the ROGA, the hallmark of the ROGA is C to the power of three. That means more competent, more confident students and junior doctors, and last but not least, more caring. Caring and empathy. It's interesting, induction of labor, some mothers back you to induce labor because they can't 
can't, uh, can't cope anymore. They cry and they want you to induce labor. And you feel it's very tough to, um, to decline their request. And on the other hand, the woman might feel if you recommend as a doctor to induce labor, that as a failure or at their fault, or they think that this confirms that we doctors are too aggressive, don't give mother nature a chance, or the doctor is taking over. And everything between these two options. So do not second guess. Ask the woman two questions, the six million dollar questions. What is going through your mind and what does it mean to you? This means if these questions are generally answered uh, by the woman and you listen very carefully, that she feels understood and most likely the doctor and the woman are on the same page and the decision is a joint decision, which in my view is the preferred way. Of course, when you would recommend a recommendation, you explain the recommendation, the, in the, uh, the motives, the indication, the how, you provide verbal information. I like to make a little sketch because my sketches are very simple, almost naive and easily understood, but provide the woman with some written information, a leaflet, a brochure as well. Important that you understand what the process means, how long it roughly will take, whether she has to be in the hospital, etc. Ask her back, and the best question is in my view to ask her, what did I not explain well enough? It means you take the blame if it was not understood. This is a much more uh, respectful question than what did you not understand? Because that's somewhat paternalistic, condescending and not the ideal approach. Don't press if she feels overwhelmed. If you feel that she is overwhelmed, give her a break. Go outside the, co the consulting room, have a coffee, have a tea, walk around the block and come back after an hour or so. And then the decision is a solid one. This is time well invested. So this is the conclusion of part one of induction of labor. Why? Recently evidence confirmed indications are for the mother, mild hypertension induced labor after 39 weeks and for preeclampsia at 37 weeks. For the fetus, yeah, post-dates, especially if there's suspicion of the baby being SGA or RGR or LGA. So if the baby is in between, the baby is in between the two, so appropriate for gestational age, AGA, expected management appears to be still prudent unless um, the uh, study in the United States shows otherwise. PPROM at 30 four to 37 weeks without signs of chorea and unitis is not an indication to use labor. This concludes part one of this video lecture and um, I hope I made the indications somewhat clearer and I hope you will be motivated to keep on watching and move on to part two. Thank you.